Welcome to module two. We are going to start by talking about cells and organelles, and then we'll do a few videos about some lab techniques. So this section discusses the three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And then it focuses on parts of the eukaryotic cells, the organelles. Finally, it ends with an overview of some of the invading not quite life forms, viruses, viroids, and prions. As always, this video is an overview and it won't cover everything in the unit, just what I think are the key topics. Back in the day, scientists classified all organisms as either prokaryotes, which were our bacteria and our archaea, or eukaryotes. But with the advent of genetic sequencing and a deeper understanding of the cellular biology of the three groups, it became clear that archaea were very different from bacteria and should stand alone. In fact, they are more closely related to archaea than they are to bacteria if we look at their DNA sequences. For now, let's focus on eukaryotic cells. These cells have membrane-bound organelles that allow for a concentration of catalysts and reactants and a compartmentalization of structures for a particular function. First, I need you to know, I need to know what your favorite organelle is. This is how I judge all people, so think about it critically. We will get to my favorite organelle in a short while. For this, I'm serious. Have to know. Okay. Most people are going to pick the mitochondria as their favorite organelle, and I can see why. It has a double membrane structure with the inner membrane larger than the outer one, which creates these folds or cristae. This increase in surface area, this is super important because key reactions for aerobic respiration take place in that inner membrane. Mitochondria are also dynamic. They're constantly joining together and breaking apart in fusion and fission reactions as a way of segregating out old machinery into a small organelle that can then be degraded. Mitochondria also have their own DNA, which you inherit fully from your mother. So this DNA is a great way to trace a maternal lineage. Uh, mitochondria and their DNA help us realize the endosymbiote theory, um, which is that organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts arose from the engulfment of one cell by another. So we had a proto-eukaryote that had a nucleus and it engulfed an ancient aerobic bacteria that became the mitochondria. And for plant cells, they might have engulfed an ancient photosynthetic bacteria that became the chloroplasts. We also have a series of organelles that are involved in the protein, in protein synthesis, modification, and trafficking. Starting in the rough ER or the RER, ribosomes are going to make a protein here, and the proteins made here are for membrane-bound locations or proteins that are meant to be secreted, meant to leave the cell. These are then going to form off into transition vesicles, which will go to the Golgi apparatus, shown here in green. And in the Golgi, proteins are going to be modified. You're going to get additions like glycosylation, methylation, phosphorylation. And from the Golgi, they'll head out sometimes into secretory vesicles, which will undergo exotyphosis so that we can secrete those chemicals or proteins, rather. Um, or they could head off to other locations in the cell. The direction for which the peptide needs to go, the directions are encoded in something called a signal peptide. So the signal peptide is part of the polypeptide sequence, and it tells the cell, this, this is where I'm headed. Send me the mitochondria, send me the plasma membrane, secrete me. At the end of the line here is my favorite organelle, the lysosome. Once thought of as a lonely garbage dump, we now realize that lysosomes have crucial roles in biology. Yes, they use acid stable enzymes to break down misfolded proteins and old organelles. They're also part of the autophagy pathway, which is a cellular network that responds to cell stress by degrading unwanted cellular components. When your lysosomes aren't working properly, though, you can get patients who have lysosomal storage disorders. And neurons, in particular, are susceptible to a buildup of trash caused by damaged lysosomes. So lysosomal dysfunction has been implicated in diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Finally, let's talk about the invaders, viruses. These are technically non-living entities, though there is some debate about whether you can say a virus is alive or not alive. Uh, they hijack a host in order to propagate. 
they graduate they generally consist of a coat protein and RNA or DNA card core. There are RNA containing viruses, things like polio, human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. COVID is an example of an RNA containing virus. And then there are DNA containing viruses, things like herpes, for example. They Viruses are not affected by antibiotics, which generally target a bacterial cell wall. So you can't treat a virus with something that you can treat a bacteria with. Well, we will come back to everyone's favorite and most interesting virus, COVID-19, in this week's case study. Finally, let's talk about prions. Prions are disease-causing proteins. So they are proteins that have a normal shape and function, but become misfolded. And that misfolded protein can actually spread and move from cell to cell, usually from neuron to neuron. And this can cause the proteins inside the healthy neuron to start to misfold and change their shape, eventually killing that cell. This is seen in mad cow disease, which was a big deal maybe a decade ago. And it's thought to be how misfolded proteins in Alzheimer's disease actually take over the brain, moving from areas involved with memory to eventually higher cortical areas. In this video, we discussed the three domains of organisms. We also talked about some key organelles and ended with classic cell invaders. Next time, we'll talk about some common lab techniques.